Good morning. We can do better. Good morning. That's better. Now I know that everybody is waking up. I was just reminded, but uh, to have everybody silence their phones. So uh, we love Beethoven and Rachmaninoff and so on, but I silenced mine before coming here because I was reminded. Uh, this is a wonderful crowd. And we have a wonderful program for uh, this year. But like last year, this year we continued to await the unveiling of, the, of Jared Kushner's deal of the century, which should perhaps be called accurately the mystery of the fund administration. In Arabic, by the way, they call it Safqat al Qarn. When I heard that, I named it Safat al Qarn. And that's the title for our program for 2019. What is clear from the deal of the century is that from day one, it intended to literally remove the Palestinian issue once and for all. That's how it is perceived by those who know the issue of Palestine, by Palestinians, by people in the Middle East, and by all fair-minded people and informed people. It wanted, it actually was intended to liquidate the Palestinian question and remove it from the desks of international policymakers. What must be done to keep the issue of Palestine at the front and center of global policy so that it does uh, not wither away under the weight of fake economic developments. You have heard the price tag, $10 billion, which was going to be a loan to the Palestinian people to be repaid, I'm sure, by reasonable interest. And it would be a, a beautiful deal. It was, <coughs> well, anyhow, the speakers this year of the 2019 Palestine uh, Center annual conference will provide their analysis of this critical movement moment. The keynote address for the program this year will be given by Dr. Joseph Mas'ad, who will follow me shortly, and two panels which will analyze the issues that are associated with the deal of the century. The right of return, UNRWA, United States, and Israel policies, that will be taken care of in panel one, which will be moderated by Palestine Center committee member, uh, Washington Freeman and journalist Said Arakat. And honestly, that's no exaggeration. The second panel will handle the geopolitics, BDS, the media and Palestine, United States perspective on the deal, that will be the afternoon panel or panel two. I mentioned that the first panel will be moderated by journalist Saeed Rakat. The second panel was to be moderated by Palestine Center uh, scholar, uh, Dr. and Palestine member, Palestine committee member, uh, Dr. Edmund Gharib, but he's not gonna be able to be with us uh, this morning, as he called me a couple of days ago, but it will be moderated by our most uh, capable treasurer and vice chairman of the Jerusalem Fund, Dr. Aid Mustafa, who is with us this morning. We will have a short 15 minutes break between the keynote and between panel one. And then after panel one, we will have a one hour 
lunch that I hope will be just one hour. We, we usually have a hard time getting people after lunch. And then we will have at 1.45, we will have panel two. Let me introduce Dr. Joseph Massad. Dr. Joseph Massad is professor of modern Arab politics and intellectual history at Columbia University in New York. That's a huge title for a surgeon, Dr. Massad. <laughs> <laughs> the surgeon is me. Uh, he's the author of many books and academic and journalistic articles. His books include, and I'll have to read these, Colonial Effects, The Making of National Identity in Jordan, published by, the, by Columbia University Press in 2001, The Persistence of the Palestinian Question, which is really the theme. You wrote that and published it in 2006, I believe, but that's very pertinent today. And in my closing remarks this afternoon, I will allude to that, how things actually have not changed. Uh, and I will leave that till, till later. The Persistence of the Palestinian Question, essays on Zionism and the Palestinians, Desiring Arabs, and the most recently published book, Islam and Liberalism by the University of Chicago Press in 2016. The books and articles have been translated into at least a dozen languages. But before Dr. Mas'ad takes the podium, uh, staff has asked me to remind us of some ground rules, me included. Uh, one, please silence your phones, I've already said that. In the question and answer period following each panel, and I don't know if Dr. Masad will take any questions, if time will, will permit, please keep your questions to questions rather than comments and speeches. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, but as a surgeon as, and who spent his a lifetime in the U.S. Army, I usually tell people a little bit bluntly that if you have a speech to make, please consider giving it somewhere else, <laughs> not here, for the sake of everybody else. And for our online audience, we welcome your questions tweeted to at Palestine Center, and you can follow us at the Twitter handle of hashtag PALCenter19. I think that we've caught up with the time that uh, at 9.30 we said that we will have Dr. Masad uh, address you and uh, Dr. Masad is all yours. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to give the keynote speech. I'm very honored to be here. And thank you all for coming so early in the morning to uh, hear my talk. Um, let me just get this here. I will need my reading glasses. So, Trump's deal of the century, the final stage of the Oslo Accords. Donald Trump's deal of the century is the final phase of the 1993 Oslo Accords which formalized the final liquidation of the Palestinian anti-colonial national struggle for independence and liberation. The deal is nothing more or less than the last step of the so-called peace process. In order to understand the aims of the deal, we need to go back to the Oslo Accords, which anticipated this step and assiduously prepared the ground for it. Since the beginning of the so-called peace process inaugurated in Madrid in 1991, the PLO, through its unofficial negotiators, conceded Palestinian rights one by one in a gradual process culminating in the official PLO signing of the Declaration of Principles here in Washington, D.C. on September 13, 1993. The Land for Peace formula, which the peace talks adopted as a point of departure, was in fact the first major concession of the PLO. 
The formula presupposes that Israel has land, which it would be willing to give to the Arabs, quote unquote, and that the Arabs, seen as responsible for the state of war with Israel, can grant Israel the peace for which it has longed for decades. Placing the responsibility of the Arab-Israeli wars on the Arabs is a standard view that is never questioned in the West, especially here in Washington. But the PLO concession ensured that Palestinians and other Arabs also would not question it. Despite its surface appearance as a political compromise, this formula of land for peace was in fact a reflection of the racial views characterizing European Jewish Israelis and Palestinian and other Arabs. Whereas the Israelis were asked and were ostensibly presented as willing to negotiate about property, the recognized Western liberal right par excellence, Palestinians and other Arabs were asked to give up violence, or more precisely, their violent means, which is an illegitimate, unrecognized right attributable only to uncivilized barbarians. The fact that the PLO had already given up the Palestinian rightful claim to 77% of Palestine and was negotiating about the future status of a mere 23% of Palestine did not qualify for a formula of land for land on which to base the peace process. In reality, and from a Palestinian standpoint, the formula of land for peace was accurate if one reversed the interpretation, wherein it was the PLO that was giving up Palestinian rights to the Palestinians' historic homeland in exchange for an end of Israeli oppression and violence against the Palestinian people. The PLO, Israel, and the Western media hailed the 1993 agreement between Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin as, quote, mutual recognition. This construal, however, contradicts the actual words uttered by both parties and the projected actions based on these words. Whereas the PLO, who wrote the first letter, by the way, recognized, and I quote, the right of the state of Israel to exist in peace and security, the Israeli government, in response to the letter, quote, had decided to recognize the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people and commence negotiations with the PLO within the Middle East peace process, unquote. This was hardly mutual recognition. For this to be mutual recognition, either the Israelis would have had to recognize the Palestinian people's right to exist in a state of their own in peace and security, or the PLO would have had only to recognize the Rabin government as the representative of the Israeli people without necessarily granting any right to the Israeli state to exist in peace and security or in any other way. The actual agreement, therefore, did not amount to mutual recognition. It amounted to the final legitimation of the Jewish state as having the right to be a racist apartheid state by the very people against whom its racist and colonial policies have been and continue to be practiced, with the Israelis committing to nothing substantively new. Giving the PLO the recognition as the representative of the Palestinians, something the majority of the world, except the United States, had done in the mid-1970s committed Israel to no concessions to the Palestinian people. It committed it only to a scenario whereby, since the Israeli government was disposed to speak to representatives of the Palestinians in the context of the Middle East peace process, it would speak to the PLO as it finally recognized that party as their representative, whereas before it had not. The Israeli recognition of the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people took place at the exact moment that the PLO ceased to represent the national will of the majority of Palestinians. As Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres himself had asserted correctly at the time, and I quote him, we have not changed, the PLO did, unquote. However, if the PLO stood for Palestinian national aspirations, which included the uncompromising demand for national self-determination, through the establishment of a Palestinian state, the repatriation and or monetary compensation of diaspora Palestinians, and an end to Israeli apartheid under whose yoke Palestinian citizens of Israel live, and as such was recognized by the Israeli government, such a recognition would surely have been a veritable concession by the intransigent Israelis. This, however, was far from what happened. The Oslo Agreement had no place for Palestinian refugees, except, except according to Robin for a few thousand people, or 
a place for Palestinian citizens of Israel and had no provisions for Palestinian national self-determination or the establishment of a Palestinian state. All of which, by the way, we, we wrote about at the time, back in 1993 and 94. I wrote several articles about this. This is not some new realization that people had. This was clear from the moment it had been signed. Since the Arafat leadership had abandoned all the major national aspirations of the PLO, or that the PLO embodied before Oslo, the Israeli recognition of the organization turned out not to be a concession at all. Rather, it was a triumph for the Israeli colonial settler project, which had always sought to negotiate with people and governments who did not actually represent the indigenous Palestinians or their rights. The Israeli recognition of the PLO, therefore, did not depart from Israeli strategy, which successive Israeli governments had followed diligently of liquidating the Palestinian national struggle. The establishment of the Israeli settler colony resulted in the usurpation of all of historic Palestine and in the process, the physical separation of the Palestinian people into three major segments in relation to Palestine. Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinians in the occupied territories in East Jerusalem, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and the expelled Palestinians in exile. The agreement was engineered by definition not to redress the injustices inflicted on the Palestinian people as such, rather of transforming the Israeli occupation over parts of the occupied territories into something with which both the PLO leadership and the Israelis more generally could live. This would be followed later by the complete separation of Gaza from the West Bank the territorial contraction of the area called the West Bank, and the severance of East Jerusalem completely. Whereas since the Israeli occupation and subsequent annexation of the Palestinian city of East Jerusalem, Palestinians living in that city were accorded a different legal and political status by the Israelis, the Oslo Agreement separated those Palestinians who live in Gaza from the West Bank and then subdivided the West Bank into areas A, B, and C, dotted by hundreds of Israeli checkpoints, as I'm sure many of you know. Much of the PLO and later Palestinian authority flexibility in surrendering the rights of the Palestinian people was connected to the question of funding. The story of the Palestinian national movement can only be told through the ways and means that different Arab and non-Arab governments have tried to control it. While the PLO was established in 1964 and controlled principally by the Arab League of States, within which the regime of Jamal Abdel Nasser was hegemonic, the defeat of 1967, of the 1967 war, weakened that arrangement, leading to the non-PLO revolutionary guerrillas takeover of the organization in 1968-69. With Fatah and the leftist Palestinian guerrillas at the helm, the revolutionary potential of the PLO constituted such a threat that it precipitated an all-out war in Jordan in 1970, a situation that powerful and repressive Arab regimes did not want to see repeated. <clears throat> it is in this context that Arab oil money from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, later Libya, the United Arab Emirates, and Iraq began to pour into the coffers of the PLO, primarily to ensure that it would not encourage revolutionary change in Arab countries, and that in so far as it did not compromise Arab regime interests, its weapons should only be directed towards Israel. The Lebanese Civil War and the PLO role in it in the second half of the 1970s remained a problem, but as far as these countries were concerned or these regimes were concerned, it was a problem that they were able to contain. This is very important because remember, imagine the African National Congress being actually funded by Mobutu, by the most reactionary African regimes. The PLO, a third world liberation movement, was actually funded by the most reactionary Arab regimes. I mean, an exception in the third world. You know, nothing like that happened anywhere else. With the onset of the 1980s and the military defeat of the PLO in 1982 in Beirut at the hand of the Israeli invaders, Arab funding for the PLO was no longer conditioned on its not turning its weapons against them only, but that the organization would also no longer target Israel. The various attempts at agreements between the PLO and King Hussein in the mid-1980s were part of that plan. With continued Israeli and US refusal to deal with the PLO no matter how much its policy and ideology had changed, 
the situation remained frozen until the first Palestinian uprising in 1987 gave the PLO the opportunity to lay down its weapons against Israel. The formalization of this transformation took place in Algiers in 1988 and later at the Madrid so-called peace conference in 1991. As oil funding dried up after the Gulf War of 1990-91, as did diplomatic support with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, the PLO needed funders or new funders. Enter the United States and its allies whose terms included the Oslo Agreement and that the newly created and Fatah-controlled Palestinian Authority should indeed be armed, but that its weapons should have a new target. So whereas the conditions before were that its weapons should not target Arab regimes and later not target Israel itself, the new target would be the Palestinian people themselves and that its weapons should be directed at them and at their anti-colonial resistance. The Palestinian Authority obliged and continued to receive its funding until the Second Intifada when contra their raison d'etre, some of its security forces engaged the Israelis in gunfire when the Israelis attacked Palestinian civilians. Funding was intermittently stopped. Arafat was placed under house arrest, or if you will, uh, office arrest, and the Israelis reinvaded the West Bank. A resumption of steady funding continued after Arafat's death, conditional upon Mahmoud Abbas's seriousness in pointing Palestinian guns at the Palestinians themselves, which he and the Palestinian authorities' thuggish security apparatuses, trained as they were by the Americans, have done diligently. Since PA security coordination with the Israeli occupation army became, in the view of the PA's unelected President Mahmoud Abbas, sacred and untouchable, it continued unhindered, to, or continues unhindered to this day. In the meantime, while the PA had forsaken the rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel to equal citizenship when it recognized Israel, despite Israel's dozens of discriminatory racist laws, the question of the Palestinian refugees continued to plague its diplomacy. Yasser Arafat obliged in a now infamous op-ed piece in the New York Times in 2002 in which he surrendered the Palestinians' right of return. Arafat frankly expressed his, and I quote, understanding and respect of the Israeli need to maintain Jewish demographic supremacy and thus Israel's colonial and racist character. He asserted, and I quote him, we understand Israel's demographic concerns and understand that the right of return of Palestinian refugees, a right, mind you, guaranteed under international law and United Nations Resolution 194, must be implemented in a way that takes into account such Israeli concerns." Unquote. Arafat proceeded to state that he was looking to negotiate with Israel on, quote, creative solutions to the plight of the refugees while respecting Israel's demographic concerns, unquote. That is, respecting its Jewish supremacist demographic concerns. Arafat's position was reiterated by his U.S. picked successor, Mahmoud Abbas, who, con who conceded his own right to return to the city of Safad, now in Israel, from which he and his family had been expelled in 1948. Ten years after Arafat's concession, Abbas declared on Israeli television in November 2012, and I quote, Palestine now for me is 67 borders, with East Jerusalem as its capital. This is now and forever. This is Palestine for me. I'm a refugee, but I am living in Ramallah. I believe that the West Bank and Gaza is Palestine, and the other parts are Israel." Unquote. Now that Israel's right to be a racist state was guaranteed by the Palestinian leadership, wherein its racist demographic concerns would no longer be threatened either by the demand for equality for Palestinian citizens or by the return of the Palestinian refugees it expelled, attention was focused on East Jerusalem and West Bank colonization as precursors to the final liquidation of the Palestinian national struggle. The failure of the Camp David talks in the summer of 2000, which resulted in Yasser Arafat's rejection of Ehud Barak's final offer, which very likely forms the territorial basis of Trump's deal, although the latter promises to be less generous, I suspect, made it clear that the Oslo Accords, what the Oslo Accords had in store for the Palestinians. In the language of Israeli and Western propaganda, 
Ehud Barak offered Arafat 73% of the West Bank, which could expand in 10 to 25 years to 91%. Indeed, some American and Israeli accounts insisted that what Barak offered was 95% of the West Bank. The West Bank, however, means something different for the Israelis from what it means to the Palestinians and to international law. The West Bank was the name the Jordanian authorities gave to the central and eastern parts of Palestine that they annexed in 1950. This included the small city of East Jerusalem, which was six square kilometers in size when the Israelis occupied it in 1967. Israel, however, redefined the West Bank as not only to exclude the small city of East Jerusalem, but in fact also to exclude the much expanded city which the Israelis annexed in 1967 and ratified their annexation in 1980 by expanding its size at the time to 70 square kilometers at the expense of West Bank lands. That is, they expanded East Jerusalem to almost 12 times its original size. United Jerusalem was renamed in the 1980s by the Israelis as Greater Jerusalem and it was expanded again to almost 300 square kilometers by stealing more land from the West Bank. Indeed, Greater Jerusalem has come to encompass, at the time, almost 10% of the West Bank, not to speak of the more recent plan of Metropolitan Jerusalem, whose geographic size is, has been expanded by the Israelis to encompass as much as 25% or more of West Bank lands. It is this united Jerusalem as the eternal capital of Israel that is not part of the negotiations. Earlier talk of renaming the adjacent village of Abu Dis as the new East Jerusalem to satisfy the PA was inconclusive over the last two decades. Though in 2017, Trump formalized the question of Abu Dis as the only possible PA capital in the future. Trump's move of the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was meant to remove any hope for the reopening of negotiations on this question before he unleashed his deal of the century. Even the question of the colonial settlements was settled through preliminary arrangements with the PA and the Americans that basically that all the big blocks of settlements would be annexed to Israel in exchange for allegedly some land that Israel might cede to the Palestinian Authority. With all these issues being parts of talks and discussions, there were never any commitments to a Palestinian state by the Israelis or really the Americans, even when the Americans would speak of a two-state solution, as all indications were that if a PA mini-state were established, it would have no army and no sovereignty over water or borders and no sovereignty over Jewish settlements, etc. Essentially, what was being offered was exactly what the, what the PA was able to obtain during and after Oslo, namely a Palestinian diplomatic and administrative staff to manage the population and a Palestinian coercive security force to assist the Israeli army in repressing the Palestinian people's resistance to Israeli colonialism. In addition, the Palestinian Authority and the Israelis created an economic environment from which Palestinian businessmen, both local and from the diaspora, could profit from the ongoing Israeli occupation and they have profited handsomely. The cessation of the peace process under Benjamin Netanyahu since 2014 is fully in keeping with the Oslo Accords. As I mentioned earlier, the Accords only stipulated that Israel recognize the PLO as a sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, and that if Israel were to negotiate with representatives of the Palestinians in the context of the Middle East peace process, it would negotiate with the PLO. However, Israel did not commit to open-ended open negotiations or to concluding a peace agreement with the PLO, especially in the absence of a peace process. And I think Netanyahu is correct on this. Indeed, even Trump's closure of the offices of the PLO mission in Washington, DC, which PA propagandists mislabeled as a Palestinian embassy you know, a year, over a year ago, was in keeping with the Oslo agreements and with US policy before and after Oslo. After all, Arafat had become persona non grata in the U.S. following his refusal to sign an agreement at Camp David in 2000, just like the PA mission had become more so, you know, more recently uh, to occupy a very similar position. It is in this context that the U.S. moved in the last year to dismantle UNRWA and the very legal category of refugee as applied to Palestinian refugees, 
moved its embassy to Jerusalem, withdrew its commitment to a two-state solution, hatched a plan with the aid of the Egyptian government and the Qataris for a permanent resolution to Gaza's so-called humanitarian crisis, raised no objections to continued colonial settlement in the West Bank, and issued no official objections to Israel's racist nation-state law enacted in July 2018. The background to the nation state law is most relevant to the aims of Trump's deal of the century. Since its inception, the Zionist project to colonize Palestine has been determined and uncompromising in its colonial settler goals. But at the same time, it demonstrated ideological innovation and acrobatics in packaging its takeover of the land of the Palestinians. While the initial goal was to create colonial Jewish majority in Palestine, successfully achieved for a few decades through the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in 1948 and again in 1967, Zionists have more recently had to face the old new reality of Jews as a minority in their own settler colonial state. The Israeli government has been obsessing about the dwindling number of Jews and rising number of Palestinians under its rule for decades. This has led to this has led it to convene several conferences on the demographic danger Palestinians constitute to its racist colonial settler project. The first conference, sponsored by the Institute of Policy and Strategy at the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center, was inaugurated in December 2000. One of the main points identified in the 52-page conference report was the concern over the numbers needed to maintain the Jewish supremacy of Israel. I'll quote, the high birth rate of Palestinian citizens of Israel brings into question the future of Israel as a Jewish state. The present demographic trends, should they continue, challenge the future of Israel as a Jewish state. Israel has two alternative strategies, adaptation or containment. The latter requires a long-term energetic Zionist demographic policy whose political, economic, and educational effects would guarantee the Jewish character of Israel. Unquote. The conference was not some marginal affair convened by racist academics and experts. On the contrary, Israel's current, at the time, and former prime ministers attended, and Israeli President Moshe Katsav addressed the attendees. The conference was co-sponsored by the American Jewish Committee, the Israel Center for Social and Economic Progress, the Israeli Defense Ministry, the Jewish Agency, the World Zionist Organization, the National Security Center at Haifa University, the Israeli National Security Council of the Prime Minister's Office, and on and on. Needless to say, the two strategies the conference elaborated to alter Jewish minority rule over a majority Palestinian population failed. From the 1950s through the 1990s, Israel insisted that Arab states recognize its so-called right to exist, a formula, as many of you know, that no other state has ever required, because international law does not recognize or does not think a state can be recognized except de facto or de jure, but none has a legal right to exist. Right? I mean, the US, for example, never recognized the Soviet Union's right to exist, and the Soviet Union never recognized the US's right to exist. They just had you know, formal recognition, but not a right to exist. By the 1970s, when the PLO insistently called for the Palestinian people to realize their right to self-determination, Israel countered with a so-called Israeli self-determination, as they used to call it in the 70s. This would be expressed in September 1972 by then Israeli foreign minister, the South African-born Aubrey Eban, or Abba even, as he came to be known. Um, uh, who declared at the time, and I quote him, that Israeli self-determination should take moral and historical precedence over Palestinian self-determination, though it does not rule it out entirely, unquote. <laughs> Eben's recognition was not unlike earlier statements that were made by David Ben-Gurion or Hayim Weizmann since the 1920s, which placed the Jewish right of conquest of Palestine as superior to the Palestinians' right of self-determination. By 2007, the Israeli government of Ehud Olmert and Benjamin Netanyahu thereafter insisted that since Egypt and Jordan and the PLO 
the latter, as we know, was transformed through the Oslo Accords from a liberation movement to a subsidiary of Israeli colonialism, since all of them were forced to recognize Israel's so-called right to exist as a settler colony whose legitimacy could no longer be questioned, the new task before the Palestinians and all other Arabs was to recognize Israel's right to exist, and I quote, as a Jewish state, meaning that they should recognize it as a a legitimate Jewish settler colony with the right to privilege Jews racially and religiously over non-Jews in law and institutional practice. In this last phase, Israeli propagandists began to speak of Jewish self-determination rather than Israeli self-determination, as they had done in the 1970s. While we were previously told that Israeli self-determination takes precedence over Palestinian self-determination, we are now told that the Palestinians have no such right at all. This was formalized in the nation state law, which declared, and I quote, the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people in which it fulfills its historical right to self-determination and that the right to exercise national self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. End of quote. The point of the exclusivity of self-determination for the Jewish colonists and their descendants is that it must be exercised regardless of demographics. Israel had no choice but to drop its liberal democratic pretense. Herein lies the importance of the enactment of Israel's nation state law. Its enactment demonstrates Israel's abandonment of the prior propaganda commitment to being a Jewish and democratic state in anticipation of maintaining its illegal and racist rule over the indigenous Palestinian population in all of historic Palestine and not only in Israel's 48-49 borders. A population who, despite Israel's ongoing expulsions since 1948, had again come to outnumber the Jewish colonists and their descendants in Israel and in the occupied territories. Here, the law's reference to the land of Israel rather than to the state of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people anticipates the Jewish colonial minority's control over the whole of historic Palestine. Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state is the formula that several U.S. presidents insisted Palestinians and other Arabs accept. George W. Bush and the more stridently anti-Palestinian Barack Obama both threatened Palestinians with dire consequences if they refused. The new code for that right is Jewish self-determination. Donald Trump's deal of the century aims to legitimize once and for all the Zionist settler colonial project and its right to state-sponsored racism. Israel's leaders now accept that Jewish colonists and their descendants will forever be a minority in historic Palestine, especially as prior measures to make them a majority through ethnic cleansing and expulsions are no longer available options. Not able to reduce the number of Palestinians further, Trump's plan aims to negate categorically the Palestinian refugees' right of return to their homeland, guaranteed by international law, by undercutting UNRWA, thus ensuring that the existing majority of Palestinians over Jews in historic Palestine not increase any further. It is in light of the, recognition, or, or of the recognition that Israel will no longer be able to change the country's demographics easily that the law was enacted. Namely, I mean, to declare Israel's open commitment to being a Jewish state with, a Jewish, with Jewish minority rule, a state that is formally not democratic, and dispensing with the trappings of its erstwhile propaganda. Enter the deal of the century. The deal has only one role for the Palestinian Authority, which is the same role the Oslo Accords had for the PLO, namely that the Palestinian Authority should accept the deal, then dissolve its political class and hand over its authority to its security apparatus and to Palestinian and hopefully some other Arab and international businessmen. The goal of the deal, like the Oslo Accords, of which it is the final phase, is that all the Palestinian people everywhere need is businessmen and policemen, and not the end of Israeli settler colonialism and occupation. The PA security apparatus that has killed and imprisoned Palestinians since 1994 is highly trained and praised by the Americans. In November 1994, soon after entering Gaza, Yasser Arafat's police killed at least 13 unarmed Palestinians and wounded 200 for daring to demonstrate against the Oslo Accords. 
During his visit to Gaza in early 1995, then US Vice, Pres Vice President Al Gore praised Arafat for setting up military tribunals to try those Palestinians opposed to Oslo. While the CIA helped the Palestinian Authority security forces in covert operations initially, the US would later come out openly as in charge of training them. Lieutenant General Keith Dayton, who served as the US security coordinator for the PA from December 2005 to October 2010, oversaw their training and the coup they staged against the democratically elected Hamas in 2007, a coup that failed in Gaza and was successful in the West Bank. Before coming to the West Bank, Dayton was busy fighting America's war against the Iraqi people in 2003. He was succeeded by Lieutenant General Michael Merler, who served in that capacity until 2012, and was followed by the current overseer, Vice Admiral Paul Bouchong. The European Union, in turn, has been financing and training PA police for the same tasks through their EU Police Coordinating Office for Palestinian Police Support, or what they call UPOL COPS, since 2006. The PA Security Police has been a major Israeli success and is duly credited by the Israelis for continuously preventing the majority of Palestinian resistance action against the occupation army. Indeed, even after the Palestinian Authority's political class suspended relations with the US in December 2017, PA security chiefs continued their meetings with the CIA and their trips to Washington, DC. Also, after the US stopped financial aid last February to the PA political class and bureaucracy, due to PA fears of being sued in the US or in US courts by Americans who accuse it of responsibility for terrorist attacks, the US tried frantically to find ways to continue its financing, estimated at close to 850 million US dollars since 2007 alone, um, of, you know, of the Palestinian security appara apparatus. As for the business class, which was instrumental in convincing Arafat in 1993 to sign Oslo, they continued to coordinate their business activities with the Israelis. While businessmen and pro-business intellectuals promised the Palestinian people that the peace process would transform the occupied territories into Singapore, now it is Jared Kushner who is making similar promises with his deal. Amidst the preparations for the deal of the century, the, for the deal of the century's Bahrain conference, it was revealed by the Israeli online news outlet, Wala, that Israeli Army Chief of, of General Staff, Lieutenant General uh, Aviv Kochavi, met with one Palestinian millionaire, namely Bashar al-Masri, two months ago in Ramallah, this is back in April, to discuss the current economic situation on the West Bank. Imagine a businessman meeting with the head of the army to negotiate business deals. Another Palestinian billionaire with multiple businesses in the occupied territories is celebrated by the Israelis as, quote, the Rothschild of the Palestinians. We shall not identify him. The PA's refusal to attend the Bahrain conference last June was not a heroic act, but rather one of self-preservation. Knowing that the goal of the deal of the century is to force the PA political class to dissolve itself, the PA men chose not to attend. While a few Palestinian businessmen attended the Bahrain conference, only one of them, Salah Abu Mayala, was arrested by PA security after returning to the West Bank, but was later released after a few hours. The rest of them stayed away from Bahrain in an apparent show of solidarity with the political class. In this light, the culmination of the Oslo Accords in the deal of the century as the final stage of the Accords has ensured two types of collaboration that will continue to secure Israel's colonial settler project, namely the collaboration of the Palestinian business class with its colonial project, a collaboration at which Palestinian businessmen have excelled since 1993 and from which they have reaped and continue to reap the requisite profits, and the collaboration of the erstwhile Palestinian guerrillas turned mercenaries in the guise of the PA security apparatuses with the Israeli army in enforcing the occupation and suppressing Palestinian resistance to it. The PA political class knows very well that if the Americans and the Israelis succeed in imposing the deal, Palestinian businessmen and the Palestinian security apparatus would sacrifice the PA political class and perform the roles assigned to them. 
It is these two key elements from the Oslo Accords that will survive the deal of the century, alongside a permanent Israeli colonial settlement protected by racially separatist laws that ensure Jewish supremacist rights and privileges. The Oslo Accords inaugurated this process of liquidating the Palestinian national struggle, while the deal of the century plans and hopes to conclude it. The only thing standing in its way is the ongoing Palestinian resistance to Israeli settler colonialism and racism that continues inside Israel, in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza. The ongoing marches of return in Gaza and the armed resistance of the Azadil Qassam brigades to Israeli invasions in Gaza, the major efforts of the Boycott National Committee in the West Bank, alongside the daily resistance demonstrations against settler and Israeli army violence in the West Bank and Jerusalem, and the ongoing anti-racist activism of Palestinians inside Israel have all come together alongside the Palestinian-led global BDS movement to block the Palestinian misleadership embodied in the Palestinian Authority and its Israeli and American sponsors. It is the realization that the permanence of Israeli settler colonialism is no longer guaranteed that has propelled Trump's deal of the century. The deal's failure, however, signals the permanent failure of the US and its ability to guarantee Israel's future as the last settler colony in Asia and Africa. Thank you. those countries that call themselves uh, Islamic republics, right? What have I said that indicated this to you? Well, just check it. Oh. <laughs> You're okay with that? I'm not okay with that. I didn't oh, say I was no. okay. You were saying that I'm okay with that. No, I just, just want to make sure. Yeah. No, no, I'm not okay with people who claim to be a Christian countries either. <laughs> what is, How about you, Questioner? <laughs> 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 would, uh, would, would, would it be possible to solve the... Um, settlement problem for some Jews to remain in Palestine and become citizens of Palestine and add to the, the economy of the new Palestine mm. to get around this problem of ridiculous land swapping, which will never happen. The Shas party will riot in the streets before they allow that to happen. Or the problem of bulldozing the Jews back to Israel. Is there any room for uh, a Palestine is maybe 4% Jewish against uh, Israel that's maybe 14, 15%. Uh, uh, is that? I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the suggestion, uh, what I would consider an anti-Semitic con you know, suggestion that Jews would, it would add to the economy of the West Bank. Is this a suggestion that Jews have money and are good at the economy? I find that very problematic. No, so, if, but if, you, if you measure the economic success of the families in those settlements, it's pretty good. Well, it's pretty good it's because they live on stolen land. I mean, if you go and steal someone's house and land, you're in a better situation economically. However, any attempt, I mean, if they were to stay there, and of course, I think everyone should not be expelled from anywhere. However, they would have to lose their colonial and racial privileges and become equal. And losing their colonial privileges would mean that they would actually lose the land that they've, cho that they've stolen and on which they live. So they would have to go and rent or buy land, you know, if they can find any, so and then live as equal citizens. But Palestine does not have to be Jewish and Slav. I don't. I don't. Well, you know, it's uh, basically all of Pal the, the the Israeli plan has always been that you know the all of Palestine should be Arabian, right? And this is exactly what they have done. The attempt at expelling you know hundreds of thousands of Palestinians is precisely to make Israel Arabian, and uh, that's a project that has not been very successful. It's been partially successful but not fully so. But thank you for your question. And uh, if we can also please, uh, please wait for the mic to come to you so that everybody can hear online as well. Thank you. And we'll, we'll move to the next question. Thank you. So. My name is Fred Schuyler. Uh, two questions future looking. Uh, you had mentioned uh, a significant amount of history that has taken place. One question, sir. If I had one question then. Yes. What do you recommend as to how to go forward with equilibrium between the two sides? What is your suggestion for
for forward thinking. You did a great job in backward thinking. However you phrase things, we can take issue with that. But going forward, future thinking. Thank you. I mean, I, I try to suggest that. that, that uh, first of all, I'm not sure what equilibrium means. I do not equate the colonizers with the colonized because, of course, there is no equilibrium there. There is a power imbalance. Yeah, no, but there is a power imbalance between a population that has, by law and institutional practice, uh, you know, racial and ethnic privileges and uh, rights over another population that doesn't have those. So we cannot claim that we should address this you know, through some kind of equilibrium when equality doesn't exist. Right? The idea of justice from Aristotle on is that you treat equal people equally and unequal people unequally. You cannot try, you can, I have not finished, please. May I finish my, I shall answer your question if you would give me a chance according to my terms. So. Sure. I'm, I'm going to have to intervene as, uh, I mean, as so yes, the only way, uh, so basically, you know, you cannot treat those without power equally with those who have power. That is the problem. So as a result, of course, the only way to render the situation uh, uh, transformed into something that would be permanent is to completely take away uh, Jewish racial uh, rights and privileges in the law, to remove all the racist laws in Israel, upwards of 65 laws, and to transform Israel from a racist Jewish state into a state where that treats all its citizens and the people over whom it has ruled for over seven, between 50 to 70 years equally. That is the only way forward. Any all solutions offered by the US and Israel are engineered to maintain Jewish racial supremacy in Israel. That will not work. So the only way forward is to remove the rights of Jews to be supremacist over others in Israel. That is the only way forward. In the, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to take two questions at a time. So we have yeah. one here. Okay. We um, can have, uh, let me reiterate the rules. We can have, please, one question in order to oppose. I see a lot of hands. But also, it's a question, and then the Dr. Nassar will give an answer. It is not going to be a discussion. Otherwise, that would be unfair for the entire process and the entire audience. Uh, the name is Pam Bailey. I am a founder of a project in Gaza for youth called We Are Not Numbers. I'm just sort of wondering where you, where you stand in this debate about whether or not the Arab joint list should join the Israeli government, should negotiate with them. I mean, how does that affect the resistance? Uh, thank you for your question. I actually wrote an op-ed piece about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, um, uh, first of all, of course, no Israeli Jewish political party uh, has offered or will offer uh, the joint list, uh, the possibility of joining their government. The racism in Israel is such that no government would survive having a, you know, Arab uh, uh, lists as part of the governing process. However, they, d they did call upon them, um, and uh, many people in the joint list, ex except for Tajamma, uh, gave uh, a vote for uh, Gantz and uh, uh, his party, and recommended to the Israeli president uh, that he uh, that they support him and that they give him the votes. I think that's a problem. Um, uh, historically, Palestinian citizens in Israel um, were barred, of course, from joining Jewish parties. Right. That's why uh, Mapai in the 1950s and 60s would have satellite lists for Arab members to actually be uh, 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 elected because it would not admit Arabs. I mean, imagine sort of the racism, the foundational racism of these parties. Um, only at the time the Communist Party did of Israel, which was equally Zionist, mind you, but it, it was the only party that allowed Palestinians to be members of it, and I think Mapam for a while. But the major parties like Mapai or subsequently Herut did not uh, during that period. Mm -hmm. Things would change after 1966 and certainly by, 19, uh, by the 1970s. Um, and uh, by, the, by the 80s and 90s, Palestinians began to actually form their own political parties, initially with Israeli Jews who were not committed to racism, so they would have a joint party, and later their own political parties. Now, the reason to be elected to the Knesset, of course, is uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel are taxpayers, they need services that they are denied, there is institutional discrimination against them. They fight for civil rights. As, as you know, in Israel, you cannot have a political party that does not support Zionism. So basically, if you don't want to support Zionism, you cannot have in your platform anything against Israel or its right to be the state of the Jews. So that's by definitional. 
Um, but increasingly, we see that this institutional racism has not decreased, but continues. So the question, you know, basically is whether Palestinian citizens of Israel should continue to aid Israel in this charade that it can actually allow them, even as second-class citizens, uh, to be elected to the Knesset without actually having much impact uh, on their communities. I, I think probably the next move for them is to no longer participate in this sham of elections. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Massa, we're going to take two questions at a time just to make it. I'm very sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. Right. No problem. Yeah. Read the first one. All right. So, so your story of the PLO is basically an organization that is constantly betraying itself. So you have a political class that betrays the armed resistance and now a business class that betrays a political class. Um, given that I already see, you know, Zionists point out the very existence of that business class as proof that Palestinians aren't really oppressed, do you expect that in some way the business class will be that the business class will be betrayed itself later by someone, or is this? I think is there is there no knife waiting for them at the end? Okay, let's have the stream right here. Yeah. My my name is George Zar. My question is. If we get away from the ideological perfect uh, solution, what do you think the dynamic power balance in the area that is shifting on a daily basis will produce? Because really, what we wish is one thing, and what's going around us is something maybe a bit different. Thank you. Um, um, you know, the. Uh, some of the small minority of the black business class in this country is uh, very successful. And what many uh, uh, African-American activists would call the African-American misleadership in this country has also benefited from this racist system, but the majority of blacks in this country continue to be oppressed by institutional racism. So the success of black businessmen and women in this country in no way indicates that they're not oppressed. So similarly, of course, the uh, Palestinian business class, uh, its success or lack thereof in Palestine does not reflect on the majority of the Palestinians. And but also, remember, the Palestinian also guerrillas betrayed themselves by being transformed into mercenaries for the Israelis today. So not only did the political class betray them, they also were part of that betrayal. Um, so the business class never, of course, betrays itself. You know, its business interests will always prevail, and that's why, regardless of what comes, they'll continue their, uh, you know, profiteering, that's uh, for sure. I did not express any wishes. I gave an analysis based on what the situation is. The Israelis are in trouble. Um, last week, uh, uh, the uh, Israel Times actually uh, exposed a new scandal uh, from the Israeli Immigration Bureau, which apparently has on its Facebook all kinds of new Jewish immigrants to Israel, which turn, turned out to be fictional. They don't actually exist. I mean, they're so desperate as to actually propagandize that the Jews of the world are interested in moving to Israel, that they create fictional immigrants, uh, uh, or olim, as they call them, ascenders, uh, that don't actually exist. So the, the situation on the ground is not really in favor of Israel or the desperate uh, Arab dictatorships that it has always sought to have alliances with and continues to, right? So, uh, which is why the, the Trump deal is a kind of a final desperate attempt to just close all the possibilities that this could ever be changed. Um, I, you know, I, I think the balance of power is uh, turning against Israel on, in every possible way. Um, so, and the internal contradictions within Israeli society continue. So. Okay, the next two questions are Dr. Masri and then the gentleman here. Yeah, Let's give the mic to Dr. As Asad Masri. Uh, I want to congratulate you. I never heard the Palestinian issues exposed like that. Thank you, sir. This is really from the my, my heart. But <laughs> Bashar is my, I want to know, he's my first cousin, and yes. I gave him his first job ah. <laughs> as a cleaning in my hospital. So in what capacity can, does he represent the Palestinian people? That's what I want to know. Okay, the next question by this gentleman. Hi, I have, I have a somewhat friendly question. Um, 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 I'm Augustus Alzona, Catholic, conservative, Republican, 
in that order. Um, my question is political related to the 2020 U.S. presidential elections, which are probably the most divisive and will be as has been the U in U.S. history. Um, what do you think in terms of uh, former New York Mayor Bloomberg's getting into the race, and do you see him as sympathetic to the Palestinian people in your definition that Palestinian, long-term Palestinian cause. Now, I'm asking also from the viewpoint of, uh, I'm Filipino by birth, uh, American by choice. I came from a country that has been occupied <laughs> by Western European forces off and on, and then now, of course. And by American forces, you uh, killed yeah, 100,000 yeah. Filipinos. Uh, r oh, right, yes, yes, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm quite aware of those, but, but, but then again, you know, I, I already stayed, yeah, stated one, my one value one system. Yeah. So my question, yeah, my question is concerning, what do you think the impact of Bloomberg's entry into the race and uh, for, for the presidency, and do you think that he would be a little bit more um, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause of the last century? Okay, thank you. Uh, should I answer the question? Yes, you go um, Bashar al-Masri only represents himself, of course, not the Palestinians. He's part of the business class, and he only represents himself. You know, he, he, he built this, uh, the first Palestinian colonial settlement on confiscated <laughs> Palestinian land called Rawabi. And uh, so, well, that's the Rothschild, but. Uh, <laughs> a, that would be a different question. Um, listen, um, there's a consensus among uh, uh, the American political class that has always been against third world national liberation. The Palestinians are not an exception. So the likelihood that any uh, representative of the political class in this country would support third world liberation, let alone the Palestinians, is kind of absurd. So I don't think, I mean, Obama was probably the most uh, uh, hostile uh, president to the Palestinian people that has come uh, in this country in, in, in the last you know, several decades. I, I, you know, I feel very, very bad for Trump, who gets a really bad rap as if he is worse than Obama, which of course he is not on the Palestinian question and on many other questions but especially on the Palestinians. So I, I'm not holding you know, my, my breath on who's going to run and claim to support Palestinians. The problem is, do these people, will, will they continue to support Israel in the way they have done uh, for many years? And I think they do, right? So you, you basically have uh, a new equally uh, you know, pro-Israel and Zionist lobby like J Street claiming to be different from APAC when in fact its very principles are exactly like APAC's. There's been no difference at all. They both support Israel's right to be a racist state. They both support uh, allegedly peace. With, you know, the peace basically, how can we have peace while Israel continues to have the right to be a racist state. That is the agenda of APAC. This is the agenda of the Israeli government, of J Street, and of the American governments. And that has failed in the last 70 years. You cannot have peace while Israel continues to have the right to be a racist state. It's just not a good combination. Okay, in order to be uh, gender fair, we're gonna give the next two okay, questions to one and Well, we will, but... No, 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 you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Massad, are you aware of this movement among Palestinians to look into the existential challenge facing the Palestine question now? There is movement called Democratic uh, Coalition, there is another called Masarat, and there is Palestine Forum. There are many intellectuals who are debating now what to do about this existential challenge. Can you comment on that? I'm, I'm not familiar with this being an existential challenge in the sense that the Palestinians exist, their identity exists, their right. rights are enshrined in, in, in law. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I'm not really clear on what is being debated, but I'm, I'm sorry, I know I have to take more questions, but I, uh, I've forgotten, I kind of, yeah. Nina Kavars, a Palestinian American. Uh, my question may be naive, but I've always been concerned by the fact that first the PLO and then the Palestinian Authority kept seeking help from international bodies, the international uh, court and, uh, and referring to international law to console and pacify those who are impatient and want a solution to the problem. What would the, these, this body 
do for us? And can we rely on uh, their effectiveness and how, how effective are they to uh, help us? Uh, <coughs> that, yes. All right. Another question? Okay, one more. That's going to be the last question in order to stay with time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, would you please comment on the influence of Senator Sanders, whether he gets the nomination or not. Uh, he has put together uh, a coalition of the most progressive forces in American uh, society, political, and so on, including the four ladies that uh, composed the squad. He gets uh, a lot of support from Arab Americans, Palestinian Americans, and uh, he is the most, uh, I think, honest politician uh, on the Palestinian-Israeli issue uh, that's out there. Thank you. Um, no, I've clearly, I mean, I, I think the PA and the PLO have been very effective in dismantling the Palestinian struggle for independence and liberation. That's what the PA has done. So in that sense, they are not to be trusted. And of course, they began to use the Zionist language by referring to the Palestinian anti-colonial struggle as the so-called Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We've never heard of an Algerian-French conflict. It was an Algerian anti-colonial struggle for liberation. You know, so that I even making it, calling it a conflict as part of the Zionist lingo, which many Palestinians began to actually parrot, not realizing that they were sacrificing the very nature and principle of their struggle. Um, Bernie Sanders, you're right. I mean, he has done, uh, 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 you know, made huge efforts to, to create a big coalition. But let me remind you, he never tires of telling us, and I quote, I am 100% pro-Israel. So um, Bernie Sanders on the Palestinian question is not going to be any different from the rest of the political class. The issue of a two-state solution, listen, we've been, you know, the issue of two-state solution was also from 1947 on the way to guarantee you know, Israel, Israel's right to be a racist state. When the 1947 partition plan was uh, proposed at the General Assembly and the resolution passed, they foresaw two states. The Palestinian state was going to be over 99% Palestinian, or 99.5% Palestinian. The, uh, the Jewish state was going to be about 55% Palestinian and 45% Jewish. They had to redraw at the end, take the city of Jaffa out of the Jewish state so that they can bring down the numbers so that the Jews would be about 52% and the Palestinians would be 48%. But even then, the proposed Jewish state was being guaranteed to being a racist state with half of its population not being Jewish. So this is, I mean, the, the international consensus of, by international I mean the United States and its Western European allies and not the rest of the world, has always been to maintain Israel's right to be a racist state. And that is the issue that has to be constantly challenged, that you cannot resolve any issues in, uh, uh, in Israel or around it without uh, questioning the very basis of the country as a, separ as a settler colony uh, with racist laws. That is what is at issue. And, Ber and Bernie Sanders is not in any way questioning this. Thank you, Dr. Massad. Uh, sir, yeah. we have a break, uh, as I mentioned, between the keynote. There is no question that th we can be here all morning asking questions for Dr. but he's going to be here for a while. And you can corner him in the corridor and continue the discussion. Don't encourage that. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you'd say that. However, right now we're going to take a 15-minute break, not 16, just 15. Thank you. Thank you very much.